right, well, hello everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name's uh, Dr. Gwyneth Milbrath. I'm the director of the Midwest Nursing History Research Center at the UIC College of Nursing. Uh, thank you so much for everybody that is here. I know there's still some people that are joining us, but I wanna go ahead and get started. Um, please make sure that you have your microphone on mute for the duration of the presentation. And we will have a question and answer session at the end of the, um, at the end of the presentation. Um, you can also use the chat function as well to ask questions at the end of the presentation. Um, a couple of housekeeping things I also wanted to mention just about our center. Um, first off, I wanted to um, announce something very exciting uh, that is hopefully gonna be announced uh, in the public soon. But um, I wanted to recognize Dr. Karen Holm, who is a distinguished nurse scientist and former UIC College of Nursing professor. Um, Dr. Holm has made a $1 million gift commitment to establish the Terrence and Karen Holm Endowed Professorships Fund and the Terrence and Karen Holm Unrestricted Fund. Both will support the Midwest Nursing History Research Center in the future. So this is extremely exciting for us as a center. Um, and we are just so grateful to um, Karen Holm for her donation. So I wanted to, to start out with that really exciting news about the center. Um, and uh, I'd also like to interrupt, or sorry, I would like to take this moment to announce, um, introduce our guest speaker. So our speaker today is Dr. Karen Flynn. She is an associate professor in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies and the Department of African American Studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Flynn is also the associate chair for the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. She received her PhD in Women's Studies from York University in Toronto, Ontario in 2003. Her research interests include migration and travel, Black Canada, health, popular culture, feminist, diasporic, and post-colonial studies. Um, Dr. Flynn has a book, it's uh, called Moving Beyond Borders, Black Canadian and Caribbean Women in the African Canadian Diaspora, which was published by the University of Toronto and won the Lavinia Doc Award from the American Association for the History of Nursing. Um, as a public scholar, Dr. Flynn writes passionately about contemporary issues, considering issues of race, gender, class, sexuality, age, and nationality. Uh, in addition to her own writings and publications, Dr. Flynn has also been tapped for her expertise for the Toronto Story Star, USA Today, and ESPN's Undefeated. Um, today, Dr. Flynn will be presenting her lecture entitled, She Has Never Sought to Impose Her Ideas on Us, Nurses and Transnational Affiliations. Uh, Dr. Flynn, thank you so much for sharing your work with us today, and um, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Dr. Milbroth, and I want to say how excited I am to be here this afternoon with everyone, even though we're on Zoom and we're, everyone's exhausted and tired. I appreciate that, um, that you are here with me today and to Dr. Milbreath and for extending this invitation to me. So first, um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, all right. Let's just... Thank you, Linda. All right. So as um, Dr. Milbreath pointed out, my talk today is entitled, She Has Never Sought to Impose Her Ideas on Us Nurses and Transnational Affiliations. Quote, as nurses concerned with giving care to people's primary needs, as they relate to the fundamental of life's needs, which are universally the same, we have a common cause. It can thus be said that nursing transcends political and geographical boundaries. I probably should. This quote, which is, is from the Caribbean Nurses Organization's mandate encapsulates a core tenet of transnationalism. The idea that immigrants, in this case nurses, forge and, and sustain multi-stranded relations as a result of shared professional identity. 
nurses build social fields that transcends political, geographical, and I would add cultural boundaries. boundaries. Drawing on archival resource, resources, sources, my presentation today focuses on ties, affiliations, and sustained activities, elements of transnationalism among the English-speaking Caribbean, especially Jamaica, Britain, and Canada, and to a lesser extent, the United States. At the conclusion of my presentation, these two interconnected themes are to be made clear that transnational practices are intricately linked to the asymmetrical colonial relationship among the Caribbean, Britain, and Canada as a part of the British Commonwealth. How nurses forge link connections and linkages across national boundaries through explicit transnational practices, such as crossing borders to work intermittently, pursuing additional training, attending conferences, workshops, or seminars, and through the journal, The Jamaican Nurse. So at the conclusion of this talk, I wanna engage with everyone about the lessons that can be gleaned and subsequently applied to how we think and write about nursing history, but also how this information can be applied in practical ways, specifically for nurses working today. I begin with a brief discussion of how colonization sowed the seeds for transnational ties to germinate. From there, I focused on nurses' engagement in transnational practices, illustrating how ideas, things, people, and practices cross national boundaries among the three countries. That's my focus. I then turned to an analysis of a transnational organization, the Caribbean Nurses Organization, and then I conclude with a textual analysis of the Jamaican Nurse Journal. The uneven power relationship between the empire and its colonies complicated measures to improve nursing edu education in the Caribbean due to British dominance in the nursing profession and racist ideas about Caribbean people capability to effectively manage their own institutions. What does this really mean? First, leadership and supervisor positions were re reserved for British and a few Caribbean nurses. Second, Caribbean nursing schools were organized and structured like Britain, which makes sense because the Caribbean was colonized by Britain. So in 1945, for example, sister tutors appointed by the colonial office revised the nursing curriculum in Trinidad. Subsequently, all nursing schools in the British Caribbean followed the syllabus of the General Council of Britain as far as is practicable. Subsequently, Caribbean nursing organizations applied to the GNC, that's the General Council of Britain, for reciprocity, which contributed to the transnational character of nursing. Caribbean nurses associations were also admitted to the International Council of Nurses. Members then were permitted to go to any member country of the ICN for purposes of observation, work, or study. Visits by per nursing personnel to the Caribbean serves as example of transnational practices. So to, a Brit to assist British colonies, various British nursing personnel visited the Caribbean, some on behalf of the colonial office, other, others as a result of individual relationships that were established between, in, between nurses. So in 1953, after a request from the colonial office, Marjorie Houghton, the education officer for the GNC, again, the General Council of Britain, visited several Caribbean islands to assess the facilities available for nurse training within the, with the larger goal of improving nursing education and service. The information Houghton, back, Houghton brought back to the GNC no doubt contributed to the organization's 1958 decision to grant full recognition of the purposes of registration by the GNC to nurses trained at the Colonial and San Bernardo hospitals. This is in Trinidad and Tobago. With this, so, so subsequently, Caribbean organizations then applied to the GNC for reciprocity. Um, in 1958, for example, Mary Henry, former registrar of the GNC, again visited Trinidad. According to Henry, it was, quote, a never to be forgotten six and a half days, six and a half days paced with discussions, visits to hospitals, sanatoria, health centers to the Ministry of Health and to the federal building, unquote. 
In addition, Henry attended a dinner party hosted by the National Council of Trinidad and Tobago and met nurses who were members of the council. Henry's recollection of the trip is a, was as follows, quote, I recall my feeling of admiration for the professional attitudes of nurses whom I met and their determined efforts to advance the status of the profession, unquote. In 1970, Henry returned to Trinidad again, but as a resource person for the ICN, the International Council of Nurses. She also participated in the Caribbean Seminar on Nursing in Barbados. Other visitors include Sheila M. Quinn, Director of the Social and Economic Welfare Division of the ICN, who traveled to Jamaica for the sixth biannual conference of the Caribbean Nurses Association, organization rather, in July, 1968. Likewise, in April of the same year, Helen K. Musselman, executive director of the CNA, that's the Canadian Nursing Association, attended the fourth nursing education seminar held in Guyana. I should also add that visits by British and Caribbean nurse Canadian nursing personnel continued even as Caribbean nations became formally independent of the British Empire in the early 1960s to the early 1980s. What we're seeing here is that nurses became embedded in transnational wet networks, which was, also a, which was also a byproduct of an occupation that required traveling and the exchange of information across destination sites, which significantly contributed to nursing education in the colonies before and after independence. For example, Lois Smith, a Canadian consultant, spent 1967 in Jamaica working with the, administ working with the administration at Bellevue Hospital towards achieving better patient care. During the same time, Barbara Secting, another Canadian, joined the Kingston Public Hospital as a visiting professor for a year before returning to Canada. Along with the idea she brought with her to Kingston, Jamaican nurses also hope that, quote, she too will have some ideas to take home with her, reflecting their expectations of a multilateral exchange of ideas. Caribbean nurses acutely recognize their unequal position within the larger global sphere of nursing. While Caribbean nurses require the expertise of foreign white nurses and administrators who traveled to the Caribbean, they were mindful of them transplanting their ideas without considering the Jamaican or Caribbean context. This concern came to the fore in an article on Dr. Ray Chiktik, a uh, Canadian who traveled to Jamaica during the late 1960s as a, as a World Health Organization consultant to assist the Kingston Public Hospital in, in reorganizing its nursing program. Among her other responsibilities, Dr. Chittick developed the country's first advanced courses in nursing education and teaching. The article saw Chittick's work as an example of a successful transnational exchange rooted in mutual respect. Quote, those nurses who work closely with Chittick have been imp impressed by her extraordinary patience and humility and her capacity for concentrated work. She has never sought to impose her ideas on us, but always waited to learn from us the details of the Jamaican situation and allowed us to decide what would be appropriate for our use." Unquote. Jamaican nurses consciously selected from the coffer of knowledge that Chick offered, and in doing so, they actively participated in constructing and generating their own version of the nursing program. So despite this historical asymmetric colonial relationships between the Caribbean and Britain and between, and between the Caribbean and Canada as a white settler colony that structured these visits, linkages and ties transformed the island nursing systems. At the same time, these associations went beyond the sort of colonial commonwealth dyad um, to reflect a shared nursing identity, however contrived. The flows and exchanges of ideas and activities pertaining to nursing remained far from one dimensional. White nurses were not the only individuals with their own agendas traveling to and from the Caribbean. Caribbean nurses reciprocated with visits of their own to Britain. For example, Mrs. Dolly, president of the Nursing Council of Trinidad and Tobago, visited the United Kingdom in 1961, as did Mrs. Waterman, then president of the council during the colonial period. 
These travels thus work to decenter the empire colony paradigm that characterizes early migration scholarship. Equally significant, Caribbean nurses, nurses actively participated in myriad cross-border activities, even if, some of the, even if some of them remained anchored in a specific geographical locale. The diverse representations from various countries that attended the 6th CNO Biennial Conference held in Jamaica in 1968 rendered these connections visible. In addition to delegates from the Caribbean and elsewhere, international speakers included Dorothy Cornelius, president of the American Nurses Association, Sheila Quinn, executive director of the ICN, and Margaret Lamb, chair of the General Nursing Council for Scotland. Indeed, within these transnational social, indeed, within the transnational social networks developed at such conferences, nurses engaged in numerous cross-border activities and formed relationships that did not necessarily require migration, whether for training or employment. As members of the I, as members of the ICN, Caribbean nurses and students also attended international conferences. For example, approximately 23 Caribbean nurses attended the 14th Quadrennial ICN Conference in Montreal in, June, in, in 1969. Caribbean nursing leaders also participated as members of panels. Julia Symes as, uh, joined a session on nursing legislation and Gertrude Swabi participated in writing for the professional press. The reaction of Doreen Wilson, student representative for the Student Nurses Association of, Kings, of the Kingston Public Hospital to the meet, meeting is instructive. And she states, I was greatly moved by the large attendance of nurses from all over the world. They gathered to exchange ideas and share common interests. And this demonstrated to me that there is strength in unity and that through the IC and every registered nurse who's a member of her, for her National Nurses Association has the privilege of helping us improve our professional standards and so improving nursing care. The Congress has stimulated me greatly and I hope to spread this feeling through the channel of our Student Nurses Association." Unquote. These cross-border interactions allow diverse groups of women and students to forge, nurse, forge ties and articulate a collective though often contested notion of professional identity. Despite the, the, this, this is despite the political economy of healthcare in the Caribbean. However, we can also map transnational exchanges through those who attended nursing schools outside the region. The marginalization of colonies vis-a-vis -vis the empire and the resulting dearth of resources rendered border crossings for educational purposes inevitable. Indeed, Ruby Graham King and other nursing leaders, many of whom traveled and trained overseas, knew that such crossings would benefit not only individual nurses, but also the occupation. Consequently, the CNO em emphasized the specific contributions that nurses could make to the field of nursing by leaving the region. They would return home inspired and re reinvigorated with new skills, ideas, and research agendas. Subsequently, the CNO recommended that nursing councils and associations persuade local governments to help nurses obtain more scholarships for necessary study abroad, not only in Great Britain, but in Canada and the United States. Here, King elaborates on the benefits of traveling overseas, quote, a nurse confined to her own region will eventually misinterpret her own importance in the vast body of nursing personnel all over the globe. Travel and scholarships will help her to see and appreciate the contributions of other graduates in the other regions. The tremendous amount of research being done on diseases which in her own region are common and which there is no visible sign of curative endeavor." Unquote. Caribbean nurses appear to have embodied a distinct sensibility as evidenced by Nita Barrow, a University of Toronto School of Nursing graduate who remains one of the most well-known Caribbean nurse leaders. Barrow grad graduated from the Barbados General Hospital, which is now the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in 1938. During nurse training, Barrow met Nora Cotton Stout, also a graduate of the University of Toronto Nursing School and the first Canadian supervisor at the British uh, Barbados General Hospital. When Barrett told Stout that she wanted, she wanted to seek additional nurse training overseas, 
Stark recommended the University of Toronto School of Nursing and suggested that Barrow apply for the Rockefeller Foundation scholarship, which he did. And in 1943, Barrow attended the University of Toronto School of Nursing to pursue a one-year post-basic course in public health nursing. She graduated in 1944 as a valedictorian, giving an impressive speech on the training of nurses in Barbados and the state of public health in the island. Barr's choice of topic was far from incidental, at least that's what I argue. In this venue, compromising healthcare practitioners, administrators, and representatives from the Rockefeller Foundation, the speech held far-reaching implications that led to additional connections with healthcare representatives and additional educational benefits. After Barrow's speech, a Rockefeller representative asked her to stay for another year at the University of Toronto School of Nursing to pursue a concentration in nursing education with, a pri with teaching as her primary focus. The representative knew of teaching positions at the Jamaica School of Public Health, but claimed that there were no qualified Caribbean applicants. Hmm. How many times have we heard that one? So Barra did her field work in Jamaica and several months later, she became an assistant teacher with the School of Public Health in Jamaica, the first Caribbean nurse to hold that position. Barrow established a one-year public health post-diploma program with an emphasis on theory and practice, no doubt using the University of Toronto School of Nursing program as a guide while remodeling it to fit the Jamaican context. Nurses such as Barrow, who traveled up overseas for professional purposes, advanced Caribbean nursing education and training. Conscious of the deficiencies facing the profession and the entire Caribbean and the entire Caribbean, nurses who returned home worked hard to improve the image and status of Caribbean practitioners. These nurses impl implemented programs and ideas that they acquired from their training in forms that fit the local setting. These are some of the ways that Caribbean nursing and, and the lives of individual nurses have been shaped by processes and relationships that transcend borders of nation states. So quickly, I wanna, I wanna talk quickly about um, some of the nurses and, and transnational organizations. So while the colonial relationship between Britain and its territories contributed to the transnational movement of British subjects in search of economic opportunities that led to British health personnel visiting Caribbean territories in multiple capacities, these are not the only patterns of transnationalism in nursing practice. The international nature of the nursing profession itself facilitated, facilitated nurse, international linkages or transnational linkages. Nowhere is this more evident than the institution building and cross-border efforts of the ICN and the CNO. These nursing organizations played a critical role in promoting and sustaining cross-border interactions and relationships irrespective of the geographical distance between their members. Founded in 1899, the, C, the, the ICN is a fe federation of national nurses associations and that was formed in the belief that nursing practice throughout the world can be developed and improved by sharing the contributions of each member association. The ICN motivated uh, Caribbean nurses towards autonomy and inspired them to improve nursing education in their own country. When nursing bodies in Jamaica, for example, debated the registration of practical nurses, Francis Beck, then director of ICN's nursing service division, argued that a separate statutory body controlling nurses was unwise and unhelpful. Beck astutely pointed out that there already existed the General Nursing Council for the island and that this regulatory body should be responsible for controlling the practice and training of all categories of nurses. Even though the final decision would be determined by J Jamaican nurses, they, saw, they sought Beck's expertise. While it was not a possibility for decades, the sentiment expressed by ICN President Dorothy Cornelius at the organization's 1977 meeting was implicit in the ICN's mandate. Quote, nursing is determined to make a difference in the healthcare of the world. It should be inspiring to us to all of us to observe the ability of nurses throughout the world to reach a consensus in nursing, irrespective of the differences in culture, political or religious orientation, language or race. The CNO was formed in 1958 
Its primary objective was, quote, to work towards improving the health of the people of the Caribbean, promoting the best possible care, and improving educational, economic, and professional welfare of nurses in the Caribbean, unquote. Members hail from all regions of the Caribbean, including the French, Dutch, British, and American territories. The organization also had members in the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada. So while I've discussed um, the CNO here to highlight trans-Caribbean connection, to avoid reifying and privileging certain border, border crossings, places, relations, and linkages, such as those between first and third and first world countries. I also wanna point out that Members of the ICN and the CNO did not have to cross national boundaries to share ideas and practices pertaining to nursing globally. Nurses who traveled overseas to participate in conferences and professional endeavors were not the only actors in transnational exchanges. Caribbean nurses, migrant nurses in Canada and elsewhere, and Canadian nursing and supervisors circulated information and ideas in the publication, The Jamaican Nurse. The editorial letters and articles in this publication suggest that international connections could be maintained in multiple ways and did not always require moving from place to place. In other words, non-migrants too could participate in nursing's transnational dialogue. The Jamaica Nurse is the official, official journal of the, the Nurses Association of Jamaica. It was established in 1961 by Gertrude H. Swaby, then president of the organization. The, the journal enjoyed both a local and international, international, international readership. According to Hewitt, Swaby circulated the journal around the world with her own funds. This meant that like some of the British subjects whose letters were featured in the journal, the journal itself was anchored in and transcended one or more nation states. Swabi also impl implemented an exchange program with other nursing organizations that had similar periodicals and the journal featured excerpts from other nursing publications, including the Nurse in Israel, the Filipino Journal, uh, Philippine journal of Nursing and the Nursing Journal of India. These exchanges reflected nursing international scope and the belief that regardless of culture and geographic lo location, the occupation allowed for affiliations that transcended national borders. It would be a mis mistake, however, amidst glowing examples of nurses' cooperation and solidarity across borders to ignore the power relations and the marginal status of Caribbean nurses before and after emancipation. There's no evidence that British nurses before, that British nurses were involved in anti-colonial in anti struggles on behalf of Caribbean nurses. Some benefit from their status of being British. One glaring example is the difference in salaries between British nurses sent by the local, by the colonial office and local matrons. However, despite um, the, the, the paucity of resources available in the Caribbean, nurses leaders remained, remained determined to develop successful professional programs. Hence, Swabi was determined to hold Jamaica, the Jamaican nurse to the same standards as other international nursing journals. For example, at the ICM meeting held in Montreal in 1969, Swabi noted, we're honored that at the exhibition of nursing journals, which was an interesting feature of the last Congress in Montreal, the Jamaican nurse took its place among journals of the world and drew favorable comments from several, from several who vis visited the exhibition. Praises for the journal featured in selected issues stands as a concrete manifestation of transnational ties between Caribbean nurses and their counterparts elsewhere. Sheila Quinn, director of ICN Social and Economic Welfare Division wrote that it was, quote, a great pleasure to find a copy of the Jamaican nurse at my, my desk this morning, and especially so because of the news and pictures contained within it of so many of my friends, unquote. Similarly, Helen Muslim, executive director of the Canadian Nurses Association, wrote of the association's move to another office and thanked Swabi for copies of the Jamaican nurse. In other letters, both Quinn and Muslim offered support and assistance to Jamaican nurses, quote, if they ever required it, unquote. Clearly, professional opportunities also motivated the pursuit of cross-border 
cross-border relationships. Regardless of, of geographic location, nurses as, as an occupation face similar issues. Subsequently, nursing engendered the creation and forms of solidarity and identity that were not always predicated on face-to-face -face contact. Letters and feature, feature articles in the Jamaican nurse attest to the fact that the issues bear, bear, bearing on nursing extended beyond Canada and other developed countries. Shared struggles with the state, the medical profession, and the overall political economy, albeit with varied levels of intensity and ramifications, further connected nurses across borders. So at this point, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about sort of the rank and file um, practitioners and their, and their, um, their letters to uh, the Jamaican nurse. The Jamaican nurse, as I mentioned, served as a critical function because it also, in, in addition to these sort of transnational um, connections with nursing leaders, it also, um, it also allowed ordinary nurses to participate in the polyvocal dialogue across different localities. Jamaicans and non Jamaican and non Jamaicans and non Jamaicans alike used the editorial space as a forum to discuss a variety of nursing and non nursing issues. As with those in super supervisory roles, ordinary practitioners also focused on professional concerns. For example, Gertrude Ferguson, former director, former nursing instructor of Ottawa, Ottawa Civic Hospital, wrote, quote, I really like the article, What Nursing Means to Me. The writer echoes many of my own thoughts and feelings. I too hope that nurses do not allow themselves to be lured away from the patient's bedside. It is there that satisfaction is to be found, unquote. In another letter, Ferguson supports the struggle of Jamaican nurses to improve their status, quote, so that they may give better care to their patients, unquote. Thus, these letters capture an, an aspect of professional identity. Nurses shared emphasis on patient care that extends beyond spatial boundaries. By admitting that she, quote, had no idea that Kingston was such a large city as it is, unquote, Ferguson made obvious that she had never been to Jamaica. Nevertheless, she expressed familiarity with the issues raised in the article. Such letters not only constitute a tangible example of transnational activity, they also underscore the commonalities that co-joined nurses despite their global dispersion. The nursing shortage that followed the Second World War also preoccupied nursing leaders across national boundaries and, relate, and is related directly to professionalization endeavors. Depending on the country, the reasons behind the labor problem varied as much as the solutions. April Davy, writing from Quebec in response to, quote, suggestions on how to ease the present day shortage of nurses in Jamaica, unquote, offered strategies ranging from allowing married nurses to practice full or part time, implementing a 40 hour work week and yearly visits to high schools by a senior nurse with one or more student nurses to give vocational talks. To deal with the shortage in Canada, some of these recommendations were impl implemented in various provinces, and Davy felt that these strategies could easily be transferred to Jamaica. In addition to serving as a medium where affiliations were sustained and created across geographic locations, the, the, the Jamaican nurse also facilitated what Yen Lee Espertu and Tom Tran referred to as symb sim symbolic transnationalism, which they described as imagined returns to the homeland through selective memory, cultural rediscovery, and sentimental belongings. For example, writing from London, Mrs. Bethina Bennett wrote that the journal provided, quote, Jamaican nurses away from home with an opportunity to search for a familiar face or recognize some familiar scene, bringing back nostalgic memories, unquote. Bennett also used the journal as a way to let readers know how vital Jamaican nurses remain to the National Health Service. Quote, most people in Britain have come to regard nurses from Jamaica as integral to, to part of the hospital scene, unquote. We can further interpret Bennett's emphasis on Jamaican nurses' indispensable role in British hospitals as an identification with multiple homes, Britain and Jamaica. Absent from her letter, however, is a nostalgic longing to return to her original homeland, which other letters expressed. In conclusion, 
Drawing on transnationalism as a theoretical lens, I explore how nurses cross border relationships and networks were forged as a result of the Caribbean's colonial relation, Caribbean's colonial and commonwealth relationship with Britain and Canada. These interactions made these places the loci of transnational activities and exchanges. I focus on specific transnational practices resulting from the intermittent mobility of a group of professional workers, as well as those anchored in particular geographic space. As I illustrated, Caribbean, Canadian, and British nurses and American nurses created networks and affiliations by active, actively traveling to multiple destinations for educational and professional services. These nurses also borrowed from multiple sites and used a range of media to communicate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Flynn, for that um, wonderful presentation. Uh, are there any questions for Dr. Flynn? You can either uh, raise your hand or um, unmute your mic, or you can use the chat function. Um, I had a question for you about the um, supply of nurses in Jamaica and how did the, um, and I don't know how to say it any better, but kind of the brain drain when you have these really successful Jamaican nurses uh, leaving to go to other places, how did that impact um, the supply of nurses in Jamaica? Thank you for that question. So apparently, um, what I was told or read someplace that we, we don't use the word brain drain anymore. We use the word brain gain. Um, and I, brain gain, brain gain for the countries who, who such as Britain and Canada and the United States that benefited um, from, from Caribbean migrant nurses. And it, and it makes sense to use the term brain gain and brain drain, brain gain. One because these a lot of these nurses were already, some of these nurses were already educated in the in, you know already educated in the Caribbean, so that meant that countries such as Britain, Canada, and the U.S. didn't have to retrain these nurses, right? So I think that's the argument in terms of this idea of the brain gain. But of course, then and now, what we see is that that there is that it does impact. Um, it, it, when nurses leave their countries, even if it's a, even if it's even if we're not referring to the Caribbean, we're talking about you know, the migration of Filipino nurses to the United States, it does impact the political, the political healthcare um, or the political economy of healthcare in the Caribbean region. And I know that in one of the articles in a report, uh, a 1968 report, Caribbean nurses were trying to really to figure out how they could prevent this sort of brain drain, right? From the, from the Caribbean, it was real concern it was a really concern for, for Caribbean nursing leaders, so definitely impacted um, the Caribbean region. Thank you, Dr. Mova, for your question. Thank you. Erin um, Spinney, did you have a question you want to ask? I did. Thank you very much for a great presentation. I'm really interested in your use of transnationalism as a lens to explore these relationships. And I was wondering about um, Musliman's visit to examine nursing education in the Caribbean. And I'm wondering how much of that is tied, not necessarily to her being the executive director of the CNA, but to her interest in reforming Canadian nursing education, like her spotlight on nursing education report and that sort of thing. So is, it, is, it, um, is she attempting to kind of mine the Caribbean schools for ideas just as much as trying to oversee things? Yeah, so, so Musselman, you know, she also had friends with, you know, she's also friends with uh, the nursing leaders in the Caribbean as well. And the sense that the sense that I got from mining the, the archives and mm -hmm. the like a nurse is that, yeah, there was, which is what is for, for me, Erin, um, is really fascinating in a way that th these, in, in terms of thinking about transnationalism and how we understand transnationalism, even though I think a lot of scholars don't apply transnationalism to to nurses in is that 
folks were going back, folks, folks were drawing, like these nurses leaders were drawing ideas, right? So Muslims is in the Caribbean, thinking about the Caribbean, but also thinking about the Canadian context. Does that make sense, right? Yeah, so no, that, no, that makes sense, yeah. Really kind of, right? So this, this really, this exchange that obviously we cannot ignore the power relations, mm -hmm. right? That, that structured these relationships, but really that there was an attempt um, to look in the look at the Caribbean, but also this acknowledgement that the Caribbean as a region did have something to teach the Canadian, exactly. yeah, yeah, right? Because it's always been the perception is like, oh, you know, these white folks run the Caribbean, like these nursing leaders, and somehow they're there to 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 impart, right? Sort of this like idea of the white savior, right? They're mm -hmm. there to impart their ideas without sort of gleaning and uh, gleaning. Um, and learning from the Caribbean context subsequently, so, you know, influencing um, the Canadian context and elsewhere. No, that, that yeah, the, the complicated nature of influence is just fascinating. No, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dean Terry Weaver, did you have a question? Just an excellent presentation. I thank enjoyed you. it immensely. I enjoyed it immensely. And and uh, for many reasons, um, uh, but aside from the historical, is our work with um, our the our West Indies partners in PAHO and WHO, mm -hmm. and they've just established a collaborating center. So my question oh. is, is to to what extent will having that international connection bolster? some of the of the, uh, the to work against the I'm trying to use the word that you use the 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 loss of nurses to other countries and 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 be able to to really be a bastion for um, development of, of nursing and um, and and nursing endeavors like research and quality practice Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Weaver. Um, and thanks for, for, for being here. So uh, I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to keep it 100% real. I've, I, 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 so I have multiple response responses to your question. Because uh, uh, McMaster University in Canada also, have, you know, they have some relationships. A lot of, I think, universities have different kinds of relationships with, with the Caribbean region. And, um, and I do believe that these organizations will contribute and have contributed to, to Caribbean nursing practice and uh, Caribbean nursing research. I think that there is uh, Caribbean nurses are, are um, working really hard to maintain the professional standards, et cetera. At the same time, we have to think about the Caribbean region, especially now in light of, for example, structural adjustment policies, i.e., um, you know, the IMF and the World Bank and loans to the Caribbean that has subsequently, not all the Caribbean islands, but Jamaica in particular places like Haiti and obviously not the Caribbean region that have subsequently impacted nursing education impacted nurses salary. And so, um, which becomes a driver for nurses to want to, to, to migrate overseas, right? So when you have a country that is, countries rather, that is struggling with structural adjustment policies that has impacted healthcare, and you have the US and you've got Canada and um, Britain and other countries, which by, I don't know, 20, whatever, 20, 70 or 2030, there's going to be a nursing shortage. This becomes the draw, the, the driver. So unless the unless um, it, so, you know, people have been pushing and begging for the IMF, IMF to forgive some of those loans. We'll continue to see uh, nurses. We're going to see the, the brain drain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Very complicated, really complicated. Uh, I well, asked, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I, so part, 
so one of you know the objectives really um, that I when I you know wrote this talk and was thinking about this talk is that to really think about to draw from what some of these nurses um, nurse leaders um, you know the the efforts right the efforts to think about how we can imagine a diff a think about how we imagine nursing history how we write well how we write nursing history but also you know, is it how can we develop these kinds of affiliations, continue to develop these kinds of affiliations with the Caribbean in, in, in really productive ways? Uh, I had another question, and I realize that you are a historian, and I'm about to ask you to predict the future. So no expectations here, but, um, you know, COVID, uh, has obviously changed the way that we exchange information, especially cross borders. And there's been a lot of talk about vaccine passports and a lot of other things restricting travel. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't look like COVID's going to go completely away, at least not anytime soon. So how do you kind of see this drastic change in how nurses cross borders and how people cross borders and ideas, um, both kind of from the the perspective of having more technology to exchange ideas across borders, but also looking at, um, you know, limitations in developing countries with like infrastructure and these these new restrictions that are probably coming down um, around travel. Yeah, that's a great question. Who? Uh, I so I struggle around. So people, you know, I keep getting these. Um, from multiple people. Um, yeah. So asking me, so folks ask me what I think about um, the, the needing the vaccine, needing a vaccine passport. And the truth of the matter is I have very mixed feelings about signing a petition either way, because I've not, I, because I think that there there are pros and cons to uh, to the to a vaccine passport, and as somebody as a Canadian citizen living here, who is un well, I shouldn't say I'm unable to return home because that's not true. I just don't want to, I just don't want to um, quarantine quarantine for two weeks, but um, I there there's a part of me that that I'm hoping that governments will, not just governments, because they shouldn't always make the decisions, that nurses will be a part, a critical part of the discussion around COVID. I have, you know, I've written a, a public piece about nurses, the lack of involvement of nurses in COVID discussions. And I don't mean that just in the US, but I mean internationally, to make decisions about about to help um, governments and whichever bodies make decisions about how we think through these things, particularly because nursing is an it really is an inter, it's an international it's international nursing is global, and so that's part of um, my response, uh, Gwyneth. Um, that's a that's a hard one. I did sign a petition, so. I'm sure everybody's aware of the um, what's happening in um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines with the volcano. And so there is a petition about asking folks to, I mean, it was the Canadian government, I believe, to open the borders um, so that folks, the, the people's relatives that are stuck in the Caribbean, but also if people want to, um, you know, to sponsor their relatives short term, that they were allowed, that will be, be allowed to do so. So for me, um, nurses are so, I just, I cannot emphasize enough how, um, especially with the technology that we currently have, that when I, these folks didn't have, right? The people I just mentioned, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Instagram, they didn't have TikTok, they didn't have Facebook, right? So how do we harness the, um, harness the technology in a way that can address what you know some of the inequalities that we're seeing, but also look at the power relations because that's important um, because that's that those the power relations define relationships. Um, 
But I, but for me, nurses are critical to all these kinds of discussions, and I'm bothered by um, the, the the sort of the peripheral way in which nurses, and I'm just talking about more at federal and national levels, because we are we are we're having conversations about about COVID at local levels, at institutions. But for me, I want to see more nursing involvement, or nurses' involvement at the where the decisions get made. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And folks can also comment. You don't necessarily have to have a question. You can just comment if you want to. Your thoughts and your perspectives are valuable. Uh, we have a agreement that the vaccine passport is complex. <laughs> that discussion is very complex. Yeah. yeah. yeah I... All right. Any, uh, any further questions for Dr. Flynn? Okay, well, I again would just like to thank you so much for preparing this talk and spending this last hour with us um, sharing your knowledge about transnational connections between the Caribbean, Great Britain and uh, Canada. So um, thank you so much. And uh, I did want to let everybody know that's still on. Um, we do have a grant opportunity if anyone is interested in doing some historical research of their own. Um, it's a $1,500 grant uh, to come and do some research in Chicago and in the Chicago archives um, using some of the collections that we have here in the Midwest Nursing History Research Center. So if you're interested in more information about that, please just send me an email. Um, my email is just my name, Gwyneth, G-W-Y-N-E-T-H at uic.edu. Um, so please just send me an email if you're interested and thank you again, everybody for coming. Have a great rest of your day. Yes, and thank you everyone. I know it's lunchtime and you probably, I'm sure you have other things to do. So I do, I don't take this lightly, just so everyone knows, um, I do appreciate you taking time out um, to, to be with me and on Zoom. I, I appreciate it very much. I, and I love, I love what I do. So it's good to actually engage with a lot of folks about this work. Yeah. Um, Great.